Okay, so are you all able to see when the sheep attack the shepherd? Yes, sir. <clears throat> okay. All right. Um, so I'm, I'm <clears throat> what, so what I want to do on, on today, um, uh, in a moment I'll introduce myself, but this is kind of the outline of the syllabus as to uh, what we're going to be looking at. We want to define for you a shepherd, uh, talk about why sheep attack shepherds, um, and then focus on what is the damage and conclude <clears throat> with how sh shepherds uh, should respond when they are attacked uh, by sheep. <clears throat> Anytime that you are talking about a topic of uh, sheep <clears throat> attacking shepherd, uh, one of the things that people want to know is what is your experience uh, in, in this area? And so what I want to do is I want to start out by just sharing uh, my story with you all on, on today. Um, <clears throat> I come from a, a small congregation. Um, I was born in uh, Hampton, Arkansas, attended a small church called Pleasant Grove Baptist Church. And uh, in our membership, uh, we on, I mean, top Sunday, uh, when we had our biggest attendance, we may have 30 people in the congregation. Uh, so it was a very, very small, very small congregation. And, <clears throat> and so because I come from this small church setting, uh, which by the way is the makeup of the predominance of churches in, in America. Uh, you know, the ones that's highlighted are the mega churches, but they are only uh, like, three to 4% of the actual makeup of churches in the United States. Uh, the predominance of churches have a membership of 75 and less. Uh, that's about the average size of, of churches in the United States. So I came from a, a small church. And when you're in a small church, you get an opportunity to know everybody. Most small churches are family churches. And so you know, people have some connectivity. Um, and so you get to know uh, people's lives. You get to know what goes on in the community, and the community gets to know what goes on in in that local church. And so, uh, as a uh, as a young person, I had an opportunity to get exposed to sheep attacking shepherds. Uh, I was blessed in that I had um, I had some pastors who. Um, <clears throat> who were really uh, great teachers, great preachers, uh, great leaders, and, uh, and great pastors. Um, <clears throat> one particular incident that I want to share with you when I was very young is my pastor, who was Reverend Samuel Collins at that time, uh, in our congregation, we had had some damage to the roof of the church. And uh, during the summertime, Reverend Collins um, had, he had about four or five of us young boys to go down to the church with him. And we started taking the shingles off the roof because the roof was in bad need of repair. <clears throat> and so he had us down there. He picked us up in his vehicle. He took us to the church and he got us on top of the roof and we started taking the shingles down. And, and I remember, and this was in the summertime, and I remember us taking those shingles off. And one of the deacons came by and he looked at what we were doing and just kind of stood there, didn't come up to help. He left, came back later on with another one of the deacons. They kind of walked around and look at, looked at what it was that we were doing. And we're sweating and everything. And so uh, the first deacon who came up, he hollered out and said, if you all think you're going to be paid, you need to come down off of that roof right now because we're not paying you to do this. So, um, you know, Reverend Collins, he, he just kind of looked at him and said, you know, I got this. <clears throat> well, anyway, we went on and we repaired 
the entire route. Had never done that before. He, he told us step by step what to do. We repaired this roof. And when it was finished, uh, one of the young men that was, uh, one of the boys that was with us, he was a senior in high school. And, uh, and the church had paid us nothing. During business meeting, Reverend Collins suggested uh, to the church that what they should do to show appreciation for the work that was done was to pay for this young man's um, high school ring. They threw a fit. I mean, it, it you would have thought that, <laughs> that he had asked to buy a house for each one of us. And it, it was at that time, I think it was something like maybe $50, $55 for a high school ring. Nothing like what today. But they threw a major fit about it. And it was a short time after that, that Reverend Collins left Pleasant Grove and uh, moved here to El Dorado and started pastoring a church, a church here. But I remember as a child, always thinking that the reason Reverend Collins left was because of how they had treated him from us repairing uh, the roof on the church and how they had acted in business meeting. And that gave me a bad taste, uh, you know, for church and for church people. And at that point, one of the things that I remember committing to is that I never wanted to be a preacher. <laughs> you know, I had seen, I had seen what had gone on. And so I did not want uh, to have that. <clears throat> However, God being who God is, uh, he did call me, uh, he did call me in the ministry while I was uh, in college. And, uh, <clears throat> and so uh, I came up on the Reverend PB shop during those days. Uh, you didn't just announce that you had been called to preach and then you, you go in the pulpit and you preach and you know what everybody says, okay, fine. Uh, when I went to Reverend Shaw and told him that I'd been called to preach, uh, he said to me, no, you haven't. And uh, he said, go back and ask the Lord what he wants you to do, but it's not to preach. So I went back and I talked to the Lord and the Lord said, what did I tell you? I went back to Reverend Shaw and I said to him, you know, the Lord has called me to preach. And he looked at me and he said, no, he haven't. You go back to the Lord and ask him, what does he want you to do? And so I went back and I talked to the Lord and the Lord says, I called you to preach. So I go back to Reverend Shaw and I tell him, the Lord has said that I am to preach. And he said to me, don't come back to me anymore. The Lord have not called you to preach. You go find out what it is the Lord won't, but preaching is not what he's called you to do. So I go back to the Lord and <clears throat> it's like the Lord said to me, don't come back to me asking me this anymore. You know what I've told you to do. And I remember going back to Reverend Shaw and I am just bawling in tears. And I say to him, I don't know what to do. You're telling me I haven't been called to preach and uh, God is telling me he have called me to preach and I know I gotta preach, but you're saying that I, that I can't preach and I just don't know what to do. And I'm just bawling and bawling and bawling. And he says to me, now you know, without a shadow of a doubt that you've been called to preach. And he says, here's what I wanted you to know. If I could talk you out of doing this, then you did not need to be doing it. Because what I did to you is nothing compared to what you're gonna have to deal with if you are going to be a preacher. He said, you're gonna need this assurance that you have been called. And I can assure you, if you don't have that assurance, you're not gonna be able to stay in it. So he made sure that I knew unquestionably that I had been called to preach. And I can tell you <laughs> that having done this for the number of years that I've done it, I am so glad that he made me have that assurance because there were times uh, when if I could have gotten out of it, I would have. Uh, so uh, I was given that assurance of my calling very, very early uh, in the ministry. As I said, I was in college 
and uh, completing upon my college, I wanted to go to seminary. So I moved to California and uh, wanted to go to seminary there. But once I got to, uh, to California, I realized that I did not have a strong enough foundation for seminary. Um, seminary on the West Coast, uh, you have all of the, the, the different kinds of teaching and you have no absolutes. And it was whatever you wanted to believe, that's going to be fine. We're going to throw the information out there. You decide what you want to believe and be done with it. So I realized that I was not strong enough uh, for seminary. But I had a good job in California. This was back in 1970, 1978. Uh, I, was, I was there. I had a job working for Crocker National Bank uh, in 1978. I was making around $48,000 a year at that particular time. I was single. And so financially, I was, I was well off. The Lord said to me, I want you to go back to Arkansas where you can get a solid foundation in the word. Um, so I did. I left California and came to Arkansas. And I was in Arkansas for one year unemployed and couldn't get a job doing anything. For one full year, all I did was get up in the morning, read the word of God. I would read all night, get up in the daytime, go door to door, trying to get a job. Could not get a job. Didn't preach a sermon for one full year. At the end of that year, I did my first revival and was called to Douglas Chapel um, the, the Sunday that I was called, uh, that I did this revival. When I went to Douglas, here was my mindset. <clears throat> uh, I, I had preached the sermon and I heard the officers, the chairman of the deacon board and another deacon outside of the pastor study. And here's what they say it. This young man is single. He's never pastored before. He doesn't know anything about pastoring. Uh, we can get him cheap and we can run the church. So what happened is they called me. Honestly, I did not want to go after hearing that conversation, but that's where God sent me. And what I said to the Lord was this, um, I know what Douglas need. I can do it in one year and then I'll be gone. Okay, that was 42 years ago. So God does have a sense of humor. Uh, he knows what he's doing. We always, we don't always know what God is doing. So I was called to Douglas and I've been there for, for 42, 42 years. <clears throat> Their expectation was they were going to pastor. They didn't really want a pastor. They wanted a preacher. That was their expectation. My expectation was I would be there short term, accomplish something real fast, and be out the door. Their expectation, my expectation, but then God had a total different expectation. God wanted to plant me there so that he could use me to counteract and to do some things that he wanted to accomplish in, in that congregation. Um, <clears throat> truthful, I had no clue of what to do other than what I had observed from others. Um, and, and so I went in this thing not knowing. I went in this thing not knowing about pastoring, didn't know a whole, whole lot about preaching. Uh, I learned on the job. And uh, I think probably the success, the success has been, I didn't know what I was doing. But anyway, so in the process of, of, of being there as pastor, that, that first year, that uh, I was the first year that I was at Douglas is when I learned how to pastor. There was a musician who had been running the church um, for years. This particular musician had um, really taught every musician in the city of El Dorado. So she was the mother musician of the city. And, uh, and she ran things. Uh, her and the, the, the previous pastor uh, had had an affair and it was known all over the city. 
And she would stand up and say to him, you've been up there too long, sit down. While he was preaching, she would do this. And so whatever decisions that she made, that's what the church did. Uh, there was a, 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 a man in the church, a deacon, and he was the only person in the congregation who had a college degree. And so the congregation, when we would have a business meeting, those are the two people that they would look at. If Miss such and such a one said, this is what was gonna happen, the church did it. If Deacon such and such a one said, this is what's gonna happen, that's the way the church went. If the pastor said something, and I remember many times making suggestions and they would sit there and not say a word and the church would absolutely do nothing. And it would just die because nobody would, would act upon any suggestion that I made. In the first year that I was there, <clears throat> this particular musician, um, <clears throat> the, the church again was, was small when I went there. And so they were struggling. Uh, they were struggling financially. They were uh, struggling as far as any ministries were concerned. There were no ministries. All right? It was basically gather on Sunday morning, do singing um, as far as Sunday school. We had one Sunday school class and that was men, women, children, and all combined in one. And then at that, you had maybe 10 people in attendance. So there was nothing going on in the church. When I went in, we started structuring. In the choir, uh, we had about 12 people in, in our choir. They were not presenting very well. So I set up some rules and one of the rules were that if you were going to sing in the choir, you had to come to choir rehearsal. Inclusive of musicians. This particular lady said, that um, she was playing way before I was born. She didn't have to come to rehearsal and she was not gonna come to rehearsal. So rather than uh, confront me directly, she came to me and she said, uh, I'm, I'm the oldest person uh, in this, oldest musician in this city. I've got all of these young musicians. And so what I'm going to do is I'm gonna step down because I'm too old now and I'm gonna let one of my children start playing. I said, well, you know, fine, sister such and such a one, we appreciate your service. You know, you're gonna be great asset to these young, young musicians. Well, when she stepped down, the choir just flourished. People had been waiting for her to stop. And we grew within a, 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 a three to six month period of time, we grew to a 100 voice choir. In the latter part of that year, I was invited to do the pastor's anniversary for one of the local pastors. And, uh, and she attended that afternoon service because she, she stopped attending Douglas and she was playing for other churches across the city. And so the first time that she had seen or heard that choir was that Sunday afternoon. And she came up afterwards and she said, oh my goodness, you know, this choir is just awesome. I mean, it is just magnificent. I will be back to rehearsal on Tuesday to take over the choir. And I said, no, sister. I said, we have a musician now. Uh, you're welcome to join the choir, but you, you, you can't come back and be over the choir. And she said, oh, yes, I can. You can't make that decision. The, the church makes that decision. I said, no, ma'am, you resign. So she said, I'll see about that. Of course, she went home, got on the phone, called people. And that Tuesday night, I get a phone call. You better come down here. We got a mess. I drive up to the church and it is cars like there's a citywide revival. The church is packed. And when I walk in, people are everywhere. And I want to know what's going on. And they're there to inform me that they're putting... They are putting sister such and such a one back as musician. And I said, no, it will not happen. A, this is not a business meeting. You can't call one. And if you're not joining the choir, you have to leave. We will have business meeting. And if you want to put her back, you're the church. That's going to be your decision to make. Well, the following week, we did have, uh, we did have business meeting. 
church was packed. I met with my officers beforehand to tell them that she was not, she was not going to be reinstated, told them what had happened. And they informed me, we know that she's wrong, but we are going to stand with her. We are not going to go, we are not going to vote against her. And so I told them, if you vote her back in, then you're voting me out at the same time because I will not stay here and not be able to pastor. So anyway, um, we went out. I had the deacons to, um, uh, to make a motion to the congregation that if, if um, nothing had been bought to the pastor and the officers to act upon, then it couldn't come before the church for a vote. They voted 100% to take that recommendation because they were all focusing on just putting this lady back. And so once they did that, I said, okay, has anything been brought to the pastor and deacons to act upon? Nothing. Okay, then you're dismissed. Well, at this point, now they're all upset because they came to reinstate her. And I, I showed them, this is what happens when you become a mob you will vote to do things and you don't even realize what it is that you're doing. I did say to him, however, I'm not gonna act that way. I'm gonna give you all an opportunity to voice. So I had the person to stand, face the audience and reveal to them why she was no longer in the position. Uh, she did acknowledge that. And, uh, and so I said to them, based upon that, that she cannot be reinstated. But since you all love her so much, then what I want you to do is I want you to give her her salary for the rest of her life. Now, they all said they loved her, but they didn't want to give her a salary for the rest of her life. I pushed the issue. They did pay her her salary for the rest of her life. And from that day forward, she became my strongest supporter. Throughout the remaining years, up until the point that she went home to be with the Lord, there was nothing like her pastor. But I said all of that long story to say this, that's when I became the pastor. It was when I was able to number one, act like Christ, and then number two, deal with those who were serving as pastor, even though they did not have the title. And that is, that's what I really want uh, to kind of focus on because when we start talking about a shepherd, a shepherd is a term that the Bible uses in order to describe a, a, uh, an individual who have been placed by God over a flock of people in order to uh, in order to shepherd them, in order to watch over them, in order to care for them. His job is to feed, to lead, to protect, to discipline. And, um, and, and, he, ha and he has to do that and make sure that the flock is kept in a, uh, in, in a safe place. And, and so that's the job of a shepherd. Now, what you're gonna have is, you're gonna have people within the congregation who want to feed, but not the word of God, who wants to lead, but not lead under the authority of God, who um, is not interested in protecting the sheep, but interested in protecting their positions. And so um, you're gonna have people who are shepherds called by God, but you're gonna have members in the congregation who want to function in the position of a shepherd without actually being the shepherd. And I think that if truth is told, all of us can tell who those individuals are in our particular congregation who wants to do the job of feeding, but not the word of God, feeding with gossip and et cetera, uh, who, who wants to do the job of controlling others and so uh, the shepherd himself, he has to know his own calling and he has to know his own job, that it is his job to preach and teach the word of God to the people of God. He uses the word of God to reprove, that is to bring them under conviction. 
He uses the word of God to rebuke, to expose their sin. He used the word of God to exalt or encourage them. Um, and then he is to lead them by being the example that he wants the sheep to pattern. The hardest job that a shepherd has is being the person that he wants the congregation to become. I want you to hear what I said. The hardest job that the shepherd has is to be the example that he wants the congregation to become. This is what Paul is saying to uh, Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 12. He says that you are to be the example. In other words, you are to be the blueprint. Uh, the pastor should be the husband that every man in the congregation is striving to emulate. The shepherd's wife should be the, the, the wife, the woman that other women in the church is striving to emulate. The, the pastor's home should be the kind of atmosphere that the rest of the congregation is trying to emulate. How the pastor manages his finance should be the role model for how the rest of the congregation handle their finance. Every aspect of the pastor's life should be that example to the congregation that God has called him to shepherd. Now, here's what you need to know. When the, when the shepherd is trying to lead in the way in which God wants him to lead, he's going to have opposition from Satan, and he is going to have opposition from some saints. I need you to hear what I just said. When the shepherd is trying to lead as God has called him to lead, He's going to experience opposition from Satan and from some saints. And so anyone going into that need to go in with that understanding. And then the shepherd also uh, needs to understand that his job is to, is to protect the sheep. Uh, the Holy Spirit has given us as pastors the responsibility of overseeing the flock that God has put us in charge. Overseeing the oversight mean that we got to watch out for the, the uh, wolf in sheep clothing. We've got to watch out for those things that would play havoc in the life of the congregation. And so that's, that is the responsibility of the shepherd. And here's the thing that you need to know about sheep. Sheep are dumb animals, okay? And I don't mean this in a derogatory way. Uh, sheep are ignorant, and they're ignorant in the sense that they don't know what is in their best interest. They know what they want. They know what they like. They, uh, they know what they want to do, but they cannot see far enough down the path to know what is dangerous. And so what happens is, is when shepherds start to do the job that God has called them to do, then they're going to have some sheep that will be rebellious. And so we need to answer the question, why is it? Why is it that there are, are some sheep that will attack shepherds? Here's the reason, first of all, I say it in a, a moment ago, they don't know what is good for them. If sheep really understood the value of their pastor, if they really understood that their pastor is a gift from God, if sheep really understood that, that, that man, that, that human, that is that representative of God, if they understood the position that God has placed him in and how he has empowered or endowed that individual to see after their lives, then what they would do is they would really honor the shepherd. 
most people, most people in congregations see their pastor as preacher and not as pastor. I've been at Douglas for, as I said, 42 years. And here's what, here's what I do know. There are some members that I'm their preacher, but not their pastor. I preach to them on Sunday morning, but I have no other dealings with any other aspect of their life. They show up on Sunday morning, they hear a good sermon, they hear some good preaching, and then that's the fullness of it. They're done. There are others, there are others where I am actually involved in aspects of their lives. I am there to, I'm there to bury their loved ones. I'm there to marry their children. Uh, I, I am there to counsel them in the midst of their problems. I am there during their times of celebration. I'm there during their times of hardship. But sheep don't always know that that is what they need. There are some sheep who are under the impression that they don't need a pastor. And, and, and so because they don't see that need, because they don't know what they really need, then they don't accept the shepherd. And when they get one, then they have a tendency to attack the one that they get. The other thing that you have to know about sheep is this. All sheep in a congregation is the byproduct of brokenness. Listen, any young man who is going into the pastorate need to understand that the people that they're going to be shepherding are people that are broken. When people come into a congregation, they bring with them all of the life issues that they had before and after they became a saint. People in churches are not perfect people. They are imperfect. They are the byproduct of this sin-written world. We need to get that. The church is not composed of perfect people. Actually, the church is composed of people who are hurting. And here's what you need to know. Hurting people will hurt other people. Being a shepherd is having to get in the dirt with the sheep understanding that the sheep that you are trying to help can turn on you and the hand that you're using to feed them, they will bite that same hand. Why? Because they're hurting. On Sunday morning, during the week, interacting with sheep who are hurt from broken marriages, from physical and sexual abuse, uh, from abandonment, uh, all of these issues that people are dealing with, these are the people that shepherds are shepherding. And these are the people who make up our congregation. It is, it is so amazing that when we read the word of God over and over and over again, the scripture is sharing with, you, with us about broken people, how we are part of this broken creation. And yet somehow or another, when we go into churches, we have a tendency to think that everybody in the congregation have it together. And by the way, I'm not saying that they're not saved. Even saved people still have issues. They still have brokenness. And this brokenness can cause them to hurt other people. Yes, not only will they hurt each other, but they will also hurt the shepherd. So because we have all of these people who come in among us with all of these uh, physical and emotional and, and sexual and spiritual abuse, then we have to understand that people don't always act the way that they ought to act, even in church. 
I remember talking to uh, one, one young pastor and, and he said to me, I, I was shocked, I was amazed. I could not believe that church people would act like that. And I said to him, so what were you expecting church people to act like? Were you expecting them to act like angels? Were you expecting them uh, to, to act like uh, people who have, who have never been through anything? He said, well, I never expected them to, they act just like people that's out there in the world. And here's what I said to him. And some of them have just come out of the world and all they know is a world mentality. And so your job is to deal with what God brings through that door. And predominantly what God is gonna bring is people who are messed up. Now, sometimes sheep attack shepherds because the shepherds are hirelings rather than true shepherds. I think it's important for us to always remember that not everything that bad, everything bad that happens in church happened because of membership. Sometimes the truth of the matter is, is that there are some individuals who, who's in the pulpit that's there for the money, for the prestige, rather than for the sheep. And so if you are a hireling, yes, that can lead to sheep attacking a shepherd. I think that what every shepherd has to understand is that as a shepherd, you are a human just like everyone else. You are also the byproduct of brokenness, okay? You were not born with perfection. And contrary to what some people think, just because you've been called to preach and just because you've been called to pastor it does not mean that your brokenness evaporated. It's amazing how, how individuals can be really struggling with life issues, struggling with uh, their own sins, struggling with uh, their own spirituality, and, and, and then they feel the hand of God working in their life. They make a profession that they've been called to preach, and people knew how they were struggling. But once they make that profession of being called to preach, then expectation that people have is 100% change. Now they expect that this person, because they say they've been called to preach or called to pastor, that they, they don't expect that this person has issues now. They think that in this calling, that, that God purified them of all of their brokenness that, that God lifted them beyond their own struggles. And so uh, people have a tendency to have uh, expectations for pastors who themselves know that they have some brokenness that they need to be working through. And, and, and so when a shepherd has brokenness within himself, and he has not dealt with his own brokenness, then what can happen is this. The shepherd can hurt sheep. When you have a shepherd who is hurting himself, who has unresolved issues, that shepherd can go into a flock and he can hurt sheep. And here's what you need to know. When a shepherd hurt a sheep, that sheep remembers it when the next shepherd come on board. And sometimes what can happen is a sheep will attack a shepherd, not because of anything that particular shepherd did, but because of the hurt that they received from the previous shepherd. We've got to be very, very 
mindful of that. Sometimes what will happen is you will have a shepherd who will come in and, um, and, and, and will just ravage the sheep. Uh, some years ago, I was uh, asked to pastor the church in Oakland, California, one of the largest churches in, in that city. Uh, I, I went there on vacation and attended their, their Sunday school and, and listened to this. They had 300 men in Sunday school, 300 men. And, um, and, and, and so the pulpit committee had come to me and they had talked to me about um, you know, they wanted me to, uh, to, to talk with the committee. They, 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 they wanted me to preach to the entire congregation. And they started telling me about the, the pastor who had just left. This pastor, they were paying him, and this was back in 1984, 85. They were paying that pastor over $1,500 a Sunday. That was his salary. But watch this. The church had purchased him a car, for, for, purchased him a car, but they had also purchased a car for someone to drive him around so that he would not use his car. He had a clothes expense where anytime that he wanted a suit, he just go down and charge charge a suit to this card that the church had given him. His wife had a uh, charge expense. All she had to do was go. They had purchased them a home, paid for it, given the deed to this pastor and his wife. So their $1,500 a Sunday, they didn't even have anything to use it on because the church even provided their groceries and utilities and et cetera. I tell you that information because here's what that past, here's what that pastor did. They had just purchased a, a theater, purchased a theater, and they had built a sanctuary and classroom to this theater. They had raised money in the building fund, and it was over. I think somewhere in the area of $3 million. He stole the money, all of the money, he stole that money from the church. And so I was coming into that setting where people were hurt. They had put a lot of confidence in this shepherd. And there were people who had left the church because of what this pastor had done. There were others who had stopped giving because of what this shepherd had done. And then there were others who were just anti-preacher. And even at that, they still had 300 men in Sunday school. That Sunday morning, uh, some lady gave, uh, I think she gave around about $3,000 just as a gift to the church. But here's what my point is. The minister coming after that shepherd, the congregation was reacting to him based upon what the shepherd had done before him. He, he was only able to stay there for less than five years because there was so much hurt and so much brokenness in that congregation that he couldn't handle it and they could not handle him. To this day, that particular congregation that had such a huge attendance back in 1984. Uh, I went there a few years ago and they have this huge empty building because what had happened is shepherd after shepherd after shepherd came in and was fighting against what this young man had done all the way back uh, in the 80s. And so what I'm saying is, is that shepherds can hurt sheep to a point that it can put years and years of hurt into the hearts of a congregation. But here's the other thing. For all of those shepherds who came in with the right spirit, 
and they had to deal with herding sheep, then what was happening is the congregation itself was suffering. People would not stay there. It was so much animosity that the congregation itself was unable to grow. So here's also what I'm saying that because we have all of these scenarios where sheep are hurt, sometimes shepherds are hurt and, and shepherds hurt sheep and sheep hurt shepherds, we have to make sure that when we have a shepherd going into a congregation, they need to be well-trained, they need to be spirit-led, they need to be self-disciplined, and then they need to have a love for God a love for the word of God and a love for the people of God. Because if you have just a love for God, a love for people and a love for the word, but you're not trained, then you're not gonna know how to deal with all of these personalities and, and, and all of this brokenness uh, that you have to deal with when you're dealing with people. You have to have your own self-discipline so that truthful, you need to know how to hold your tongue at times where you want to speak and you need to be silent. And then you have to be able to know people, uh, to be able to lead people. And, and so uh, if shepherds are well-trained, they are well-disciplined, they are, have a heart for people, for God's word, uh, then what happens is, is you're able to fight through. It doesn't mean that it's going to be easy, but what it does mean is that you're able to fight through. Now, here's what I want to say, that as we, as we look at the closing part of this, there's a lot of damage that occur when sheep fight shepherds or when shepherds hurt sheep. First of all, there's the damage to the shepherd. If you are a member of a congregation and you're listening on today, Here's what you need to know. When you, are, when you are hurting your pastor, you're not hurting just your pastor. What you're doing is you're hurting his entire family. Pastors are husbands. Pastors are fathers. And no wife want to see her husband being misused. No child wants to see their dad being misused. When a shepherd is being attacked by sheep and then he has to go home and, and many times he can't even share with his wife what he's going through, this is going to have a negative impact upon his marriage. Uh, I, I was reading uh, a book in preparing for this where there was one pastor um, who had moved his family to a, a, a city they had gotten there. The only resource that they had was his salary and, uh, and, and turmoil came in the church and they dismissed him. He had nowhere to take his family. He had no way to provide for his family. And as a result, his wife walked away from him because of what had transpired in the church. So it affected not only him, but it affected his marriage. When pastors are, when, when pastors are attacked by sheep, children can be damaged. And here's what you need to know. Children are God's children. Preacher children are God's children. And, and, and growing up in an environment of bitterness then what can happen is preacher children can become bitter. You know, we're always talking about how bad preacher childrens are. Well, you have to ask yourself, if the preacher children are that bad, what made them that bad? Could it have been because they saw what was happening in the local congregation that turned them from God, that turned them from the church? It is unfortunate that we see many preacher children who leave the church when they reach a certain age, they leave the church and it's years upon years before they ever return. 
because they were in a church where members were hurting the pastor. Ministers' health can be damaged because of sheep hurting the pastor. Uh, the pastor that was at Douglas uh, before I got there, this pastor um, had purchased a piano for the church. He purchased it. Guy came through selling a piano. He paid cash for it, took the old piano that wasn't working, had it put in the back of the church, put this brand new piano out there. That Sunday morning, the membership came in. You know, he's just so excited that he's purchased them a new piano. And they walk up to him and say, who gave you the authority to move that piano out of here? That piano was donated by such and such a one aeons of years ago. And come this Sunday, you better have that this, this uh, piano here out of here and that other piano back in here. They had a heated business meeting. And that night, when he left out of the business meeting, as soon as he got home, he dropped dead from a heart attack. All of the pressure that had been placed upon him. And the sad part is, is when they were having his funeral, the deacons were taking applications, taking resumes to replace him. This is what can happen when people hearts become hardened towards their shepherd. It can, his, his, his health can deteriorate and he can lose his life. And then of course, there is the peace of mind. Let me tell you, every sheep need to make sure that when their shepherd comes to the pulpit on Sunday morning, they want them to have a sound mind. They want to make sure that that pastor is at peace so that when he break the bread of life, then he is giving them a word from the Lord and is not trying to fight through uh, animosity and division and, and all of those type things. Uh, your life depends, your peace depends upon him being able to give you a word from the Lord. And then uh, when sheep uh, 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 hurt, the shepherd, it can damage his faith. He can reach a point where he really starts to question this whole thing about a relationship with God and with the people of God. And then ultimately, it's going to affect his faithfulness. It is very difficult to be faithful to people who are hurting you. It is very difficult to be faithful to people who are hurting you. But then there's the damage to the church. When a shepherd is being attacked by sheep, it's going to get out in the community. As I said earlier, what goes on in church don't stay in the building. It gets out in the community. Who wants to be a part of fighting a, a fighting church? Who wants to get up in the morning, get dressed, and then go and listen to people bicker. And so what happens is, is not only is the pastor affected, but so is the church. They're affected because people stop giving. People say, I'm not gonna give to that. All they do is fight. All they do is, 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 is uh, uh, have an attitude of, of divisiveness. No, I'm not gonna give my money to that. And then people stop attending. Again, no one wants to be a part of a mob. And when this happens, there is no joy, there is no zeal, and ultimately what's going to happen is that church is not going to survive. The doors may stay open, but it's dead. And I'm sure that there are some of you listening to what I'm saying, and you can right now name some churches that are dead even with the doors still open. They're just going through the motion. There's no joy, there is no zeal, they're not growing, they're not uh, doing any outreach ministry. They're just going through the motion because it's just that time of the week. And then as I close, here's what I wanna say to shepherds. 
I don't care what is done to you. I don't care how much you are attacked. I don't care how many sheep bite. <laughs> I don't care any of that. Here's what you need to know. You are never to fight sheep. The pulpit is not designed for you to try and get back at sheep who are fighting against you. My father-in-law, uh, who is 92 years of age, he pastored for some 50 years. I asked him uh, when I was preparing this, I said, tell me what do I say to shepherds as to how they should respond when they are attacked by sheep? And here's what he said, 92 years of age. He says, here's, here's what I would say to them. They need to remember who called them. If God called them, he's responsible for them. And anything that they're going through, God has suffered it to come through. So if they're upset, they need to have that conversation with God, not with the sheep. The sheep didn't call them. So he doesn't need, they don't need to fight the sheep. He says, in actuality, they should expect sheep. Watch this. They should expect sheep to do what they would do to them the same thing they do with other sheep. Every pastor has seen sheep fighting among themselves. If sheep will fight with each other, then certainly they will attack the pastor. And what do we as pastors tell sheep when they are fighting with other sheep? We tell them to love one another. And that's what the shepherd is supposed to do when he's attacked. He is to love the sheep, even when they attack him. If you can do something else other than pastor, do it. This calling is not for the weak. It is not for timid of heart. It is for those who understand that you are dealing with broken people and therefore sometimes you're going to get hurt. God bless you all and God keep you uh, is, is my prayer. I pray that um, I pray that, that God has said something through this process that has encouraged your heart, that has given you the motivation to say, I'm gonna go just a little bit farther. Let's close out with the word of prayer. Father, we thank you now we thank you for the opportunity to share your word. We thank you for the privilege of being able to uh, stand and say to your people that it is a great calling. Uh, being a shepherd is a good position, but by the same token, we understand that it can be a hurtful position. But we know that you are the God of healing. So we love you, we thank you, we praise you. In Christ's name, we ask these in all blessings, amen. Amen and amen. God bless you. Are there any questions? All right, if not, then you are back in the hands of. We have a question here. Yes, yes. As a pastor's wife, I heard you say that we need to be that woman that every congregation member, woman would like to emulate. So what do you do? Uh, I've been a pastor's wife for 38 years. And do you not think that's a lot of stress put upon you? I did want to whoop a woman one day because she got all up in my face. And I, I, I know that the Lord had changed me, although I did want to get an I was going to get her because I did not appreciate her being in my face, what she was doing and saying. Uh, that was the only thing I knew to do at the time was to knock her out. And I know that wasn't the right thing to do because I wasn't raised that way. So what do you do in situations like that? I mean, it's a lot of stress and people think that we're superhuman when we're not. And sometimes I don't want to just be the top.
perfect pastor's wife. I just want to see myself. So, so here's what I so here's what I would say to you. Um, what you want to be is the perfect wife for your husband. Right. Okay. That's what your calling is, is to be a wife for your husband. Your husband, I want you to listen to this. Your husband has the occupation of being a pastor. And you're his wife, whether he's a pastor or not. And so your job is to be the pastor's wife. And you would ask yourself, what kind of woman, what kind of woman am I, what kind of wife am I supposed to be to him? Listen, even non-pastor wives will have people who would get up and uh, will get up in their face. And yes, you are in a you are in a position where people are watching you. But but the thing all of us have to understand. When it comes to a believer, a believer's life is all believers, whether it's pastor, pastor wife, uh, uh, membership, our lives are supposed to be an open book because our lives are supposed to be a ministry. Now, will people challenge you to try and get you to act ungodly? Of course they are. And here's the other thing that I would say to you. I'm not a superhuman. Well, in actuality, yes, you are because you're more than human, okay? You have, the, you have the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of you. And so because you have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, then the Holy Spirit says to you, you can't just act human. You have a higher calling. Is it what you want to do? Of course not. I, I remember there was a, 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 a guy, I went to the, I, I went to the dealership with one of the uh, one of the ladies from the church, she had purchased a brand new car, and it kept stopping on her. And so she asked me to go with her to the dealership. And um, uh, uh, this salesperson became rude with her. And so I said to her, I stood up and said, "Let's go." And when I stood up, he came he came around his desk and he pushed me. Now my humanness said, "Hit him." That, I'm the pastor, I ain't the pastor, why? My humanness said, hit him. And I was about to hit him and I looked over and saw my member. And I said, but this is what she's gonna remember what her pastor did. And so I didn't, I just turned and walked out. And as I was leaving, the owner, came, the owner of the, the dealership came and he stopped me. And he, he took us in his office, he apologized and everything. And he said, and I'm gonna make him apologize. And watch this. He said, this is very uncharacteristic of him. And the man came in and he was crying. And he said to me, I'm a preacher, I'm a pastor. And my wife left me this morning. And I took it out on you and I was totally out of place. Here's what would have happened if I had hit him. The newspaper would have read two preachers fighting in the car dealership. I had a right to hit him because it was lawful that he had put his hand on me, but it wasn't expedient. Here's what I'm saying to you. You, you had a right to hit her, but it wouldn't have been expedient. And so the devil would rather you exercise your right than do that which is expedient. The other thing is this, the, the biggest pressure that's placed upon you is pressure you place on yourself. As long as you know that you're being not the perfect person, but you're being the perfect wife for your husband, that is the only requirement that God has for you. Your requirement is no different from any other Christian woman in the church. That is to be a wife for your husband, to be a child of God. That's all your calling is. Thank you, sir. All right, any other question? 
Hey, Pastor Elliot uh, from Liberty Hill, did you have a question? All right, if there are no questions, um, you're back in the hands of Dean or uh, Brother Dickens. There's no other question. Again, thank you. And we will uh, close out this section at this time. Thank you very much. Thank you. For, for Harry, thank you, sir. Great job, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Pastor Richardson here. God bless you, man. Thank you, Dr. Richardson. Similar to the same.